Hi, everybody. My name is Drew Wico, and I'm currently an intern with VCU's Partnership for People with Disabilities, and I'm a current graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health. I study public health genetics and have a background in neuroscience and psychology. One of the largest goals within public health genetics and this partnership is engaging the communities and educating them so they are able to ask the best questions for their specific situations. The challenge with this is the field of genetics is super complicated. Our goal with this lecture series is to provide a platform to educate the community while also being accessible and listening to feedback. The hope is that as this series continues, more specific topics in genetics will be talked about and even a few question and answer sessions will be held. But without further ado, let's start the series with the introduction to genetics. Genetics is a field that has gained a lot of attention in the past 20 to 30 years, especially with projects like the Human Genome Project throughout the 1990s that hoped to map out all the genes that make up humans. Now, why would they want to do this? Well, this is because genetics are responsible for making your body work. How you break down the food you eat, how much you grow, how your body fights off an illness, how you learn, and even your eye color. It always connects back to genetics. Now, you might be thinking about the environment and how it affects your body, because we can't ignore that it does in fact play a part. But that works along with your genetics. For example, looking back at your body, fighting off the flu. It depends on how bad that year's strain of the flu is. Your body will change in different ways, and that depends on the environment, but it still relies back on the basic components of genetics that we will start with today. Knowing this information, we can track the majority of human disorders and disabilities back to a genetic cause. We have been learning more and more through research being done, and it's helped us learn what to focus on in finding cures for symptoms and even entire disorders. Think of it like a machine. If we can figure out what part is not working as it should, we can figure out how to get it to work similar to how it should so the machine can run properly. This is the basis for most research being done today. The good news is that there's not a lot of difference between humans. Scientists have calculated that humans share roughly 99.9% .9 of the same exact DNA. Even with this level of accuracy, however, there are still around 3 million differences between each person because we have around 3 billion bases, or individual building blocks. We'll get to what a base is in just a moment. Genetics as a science can be compared to a lot of different things. My two personal favorites are that genetics is like building furniture or building with a set of blocks. With either of these, you have the parts you are working with, wooden sheets and screws, or different brick pieces. You have many different parts that may be identical or very similar, but they work together to make something bigger. Using the building block example, think about a wing of a plane or a ship. You may have 30 to 40 individual parts that make the wing, but each piece has its own job. When building these, you work with an instruction manual that tells you what to do, such as where each screw goes or what blocks join together. The instruction manual even tells you how to put a group of pieces together to make a wing, like the picture above, or to make a single drawer for a dresser. These all work like genetics does, and it will make more sense with the slides we're about to see. One thing to consider is how we differ in those three million ways I talked about earlier. Every genetic code is a little bit different, and some of those differences can create characteristics, like disorders or disabilities. These differences can be very small and not even noticeable, or change how the final product works. In our analogies, think about if the drawer handle has a tiny dent in it. It likely won't change how the final product works. But what if we have our building blocks and there's a piece missing? If the piece is in the center and its job is to support the ship, it can really change how it holds together. These examples show how the differences can be unique, but have multiple levels of impact and this is similar to how it works in genetics. Here are a few quick terms that I will talk about or might have already mentioned. The first is DNA, which is the carrier of all genetic information. This information is like the instruction manual, but instead of for a dresser or a spaceship, it's for your body. Next are the bases, which are the individual pieces of that genetic information. We know that DNA has all of the bases in it, because it's the whole book of instructions. Bases are like those individual blocks or parts of the furniture on the page, but once again, they're for your body. Each base, 
or part in our analogy, makes up a larger part. If we think of another analogy, such as cars, we know that cars are made of hundreds and hundreds of parts. If we look at a car so we can see every single part, this is like looking at our DNA with every single base on its own. Sure, we could put some of the parts together to make a door or to make the engine, but these individual pieces are the bases. Moving on to the word genome, this is all of the genetic information for an animal or person. So again, thinking about instructions, this would be like having instructions for every different animal in the world. If we wanted to look at humans, we would need the human version of this. We call this the human genome. It's important to know that we do have differences, but we are all still 99.9% .9 identical like I mentioned earlier. If you look at the top right of this slide, this is an example of those differences. These are two different versions of the same ship. Do they have tiny little differences? Yes. But does that make them a different final product? No. They still make the same ship. Finally, we have the gene. This is a section of the DNA that becomes a full unit on its own. In our example of the cars, we would have many of the parts, which we call bases, that make up the engine. For the furniture, you may have many pieces of wood and sprues that make a drawer. For the building blocks, the little blocks all work together to make a wing, and that wing would be like a gene. Here is a picture of what we are talking about on a very tiny scale. All of those letters at the bottom are the bases we were talking about, those individual parts. The good news is that there's only four that we need to worry about, A, T, C, and G. We don't need to worry about the thousands and thousands of different types of blocks or engine parts, we just have to worry about these four. You can see that they are color-coded. A is green, T is red, G is black, and C is blue. And if the letters aren't showing, then we can still see which base is which because of the colors. In this case, these would be the bases to the right. We can see the spiral structure here, which is the DNA, and we can see that there are a lot of bases. Now imagine 3 billion of these individual bases or letters. How on earth do we have that in our body? Well, what happens is instead of being laid out in a straight line like we see at the bottom of this image, the spiral structure, called the double helix or helical structure, compacts the DNA. But that still isn't enough. The DNA is super coiled, folding on itself hundreds and hundreds of times over like a piece of string where one end is twisted, making it fold in on itself. This is how our body and cells compact this information and it's compacted into structures called chromosomes. We each have 23 pairs of chromosomes, with two being our XX or XY that determine whether you're a male or female. There are disorders where you have more or less than 23 pairs of chromosomes, but for the purpose of this discussion, we will base it off of the typical 23 pairs. So, based on this, we can see how genes play into working normally. A gene can be responsible for making many different things, but one of the most important is proteins. There are so many different kinds of proteins that have different specific roles. The way I like to think about all of these super specific pieces of the human body's function is imagining it like a society. I know it sounds a little silly, but if you imagine how a society has specific roles or jobs for proper functioning, such as taking care of waste, energy production, communication between households, or in this case, cells, it really mimics a society just on a very small scale. Now we need to consider how many genes we have, how their products interact with one another, and what can go wrong. Scientists have estimated we have around 20,000 genes. This doesn't seem like a lot compared to the 3 billion number from earlier, but this at least explains how complicated the human body is. If we consider how each gene product works, then think about how it changes when another gene product is working with it, and then add that to another 19,998 products, it quickly gets very complicated. In our analogy, if we know that the ship's wing is changed in at least one spot, it may not hold together well, and that affects the entire ship. If we think about our car analogy, Changing a part of the engine could be a lot more damaging than changing a cup holder shape, for example. And each of those will have very different impacts on the car working properly. All of the pieces work together, and if each part is changed a tiny bit, it can even make the overall product, the car, not work. 
As a quick review of what we talked about today, here are two diagrams comparing our analogy comparing building blocks to genetics. We have the part at its most basic level, which is like the bases that we have in our DNA. These bases can be put together to make a gene, which is like building the wing of a ship, but instead is making parts of the cells of our body. These genes create proteins and other products that have certain roles, but when you add them all together, they make the final product, our body, or a really cool spaceship. In this lecture alone, we have already talked about the root level of importance in the study of genetics, what a gene is, how much of the genome we share, how much we differ, and what genes do in a basic level. Again, this is an incredibly complicated field, and so much information is coming out on a daily basis that it might be hard to keep up. But the hope is, with this introduction to genetics, you can already start to learn more about how to understand this and make it as useful as possible for you. In our next lecture, we are going to go into a bit more detail about what these genetic changes do. Some genetic disorders seem a little bit more common than others, so we will talk about inheritance and pedigrees, or what you might have heard as family trees. We'll even cover how to start the discussion in your family on medical history with what to ask. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a question or comment below. The more feedback we get from you, the better we can cater these presentations towards what you need and want to know. I want to thank you so much for listening to this first lecture, and I hope you enjoyed it.